the Sternritter are the elite soldiers within Yuhobak's Wandenreich army. There are approximately 29 main members of the Sternritter, and each of them have been granted a special letter or a shrift from the leader of the Quincy, Yuhobak. In today's video, I want to focus on the top four members of the Sternritter who are collectively referred to as the Schutstaffel. The Schutstaffel first appear collectively within chapter 599 of the manga, and it's during one of the most iconic battles of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, when the Zero Division go up against them. It is here where we learn about each of the Schutstaffel members' outstanding powers. Towards the end of the story arc, the Schutstaffel are once again given a chance to shine when they face off against their respective opponents from the Gote 13. Now, be sure to stick around until the very end of this video, because I'm going to be going in depth into each of the Schutstaffel members' abilities and the weapons that they utilize. Additionally, I will be discussing the motives of each of these four top tier Quincy. If you've read the manga all the way to the end, then you're probably aware that Kubo had left a note at the very end of volume 73, where he describes how each of the Schutstaffel are based on different eras of war. In addition to this, I'll also be explaining the origin of their name, the Schutstaffel, as this was inspired by the real world Schutstaffel who fought for Germany during the Second World War. So without further delay, there's a lot to dive into as we're going to be analyzing everything that there is to know about the elite members of Yuhobak's Quincy army. Discover the Undead Collection and be amongst the very first to join us on our journey over at Getsugard.com. In German, the term Schutstaffel means protective squadron, and in Japanese, it translates to elite guards. In real life, there were an elite organization within the Third Reich who were responsible for some of the worst atrocities committed during World War II, including the Final Solution, which was a Nazi plan that aimed for the genocide of individuals who were of Jewish origin based within Europe. The Schutstaffel were also assigned as Adolf Hitler's personal bodyguards. This is similar to the way that the the top four Sternritter are protective guards for Yuhabak. Via real world examples like this, it's evident how the Quincy were inspired from Germanic history. Additionally, the six pointed star that the Schutstaffel don is a reference to the real world Hagal rune, which is an old Germanic symbol which means hail. What I love about the Quincy's is that there is so much symbolism that is associated with every aspect of them. Kubo effortlessly incorporates motifs from European or Germanic culture, resulting in a lot of his designs or symbols having double meanings. At the end of volume 73 of the Bleach manga, Kubo wrote that the motifs for each of the four Schutstaffel members are based on different eras of war, consisting of ancient war, medieval war, modern war, and lastly, current wars. While it's never explicitly stated which member of the Schutstaffel represents what era of war, it's pretty obvious when you look at each member of the Schutstaffel as to what era of war that they represent. Gerard Valkyrie obviously represents medieval war given his Nordic appearance and the fact that he refers to himself religiously as a noble warrior of God. Pernida most likely represents biological warfare, with some of these biological weapons stemming from the ancient era. This represents bioweapons, which consist of living organisms like fungi and bacteria. These microorganisms have the ability to harm animals, plants, and even humans by infiltrating their bodies. This is similar to how Pernida's nerves infiltrate the bodies of his opponents which allows him to take control over his opponent and to evolve based on the skills and knowledge of the person that he has targeted. If you want to get really scientific about it, this is similar to horizontal gene transmission, which is the primary mechanism that bacteria use in order to develop antibiotic resistance. Askin Naklava most likely represents chemical warfare and he is based off of the current era of war. His shrift ability, the death dealing, involves utilizing toxic substances in order to to harm his opponents. This is reminiscent of the Vietnam War where gas bombs were frequently dropped in enemy locations, with an example of a gas bomb being Agent Orange, which was a herbicide mixture which was used by the US military during the Vietnam War. Now lastly, we have Lil Barrow, who is based upon the modern era of war due to his use of artillery. This of course is the way in which wars are mostly fought within the current era, with most militaries utilizing sophisticated machine guns as well as 
drones that have artillery attached to them. So I want to go over each of the individual members of the Shoot Starfall and first up we have the leader of the group Lil Barrow. He is referred to as Sternritter X the X-Axis and during his battle against Shun Sui in chapter 656 he reveals that he was the first ever Quincy who was granted power by Yuha Bak. Lil is incredibly arrogant as in chapter 646 he refers to himself as his majesty's greatest champion as he believes that he is much more than just an ordinary man as he genuinely thinks that he is a god. We first see Lil Barrow in chapter 599 of the manga during the fight against the Zero Division. Within the anime Lil actually makes his first appearance when Yuha Bak anoints Uryu as his successor within episode 14 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. When the Shoot Starfall arrive within the Royal Palace Lil Barrow immediately shoots Senjimaru in one of his most merciless one-shot kills as she appears to have a massive chunk taken out of her head following the attack. Lil Barrow is rarely ever seen without his rifle as he perfectly represents the modern era of warfare. He also uses weapons like the Holy Arrow which are weaponized projectiles that are formed from spirit particles and they are fired from a holy bow. When he is trapped within Kirio's cage of life, Owetsu Nimaya battles against each of the shoot starfall as he cuts down Gerard and manages to even dodge several bullets from Lil Barrow. Now after Nimaya cuts down Lil Barrow, the latter is revived by Yuhabak's Ashwalan. As Hashward explains in chapter 604 that Ashwalan absorbs energy from the Quincy who are judged to be unnecessary and it sends it to those who need it. The large sniper rifle that Lil Barrow wields is in fact called Diagram. He uses Diagram against Nimaya in chapter 604 and following being revived by Ashwalan, Lil Barrow is now able to fire stronger bullets which are able to pierce through Nimaya effortlessly. The bullet shaped holy arrows that Lil fires via his Diagram weapon are powerful enough to bring down the cities of the Zero Division members that surround the Royal Palace. Lil's Shrift ability the X-Axis allows his rifle to pierce through anything within his line of sight with perfect accuracy. What makes this Shrift ability extremely dangerous is that it cannot be blocked by any means of defense. Within chapter 646 Lil states that he cannot use the true essence of the X-Axis unless both of his eyes are open. Lil really shows off his abilities during his battle against Shun Sui. In chapter 644 we see Lil Barrow aim his rifle from the rooftops as multiple Shinigami flee in terror. He actually muses over the fact that it must be terrifying for the Shinigami to have no idea where their opponent is attacking from as they begin to fall one by one. Shun Sui then suddenly appears behind him after he appears to get shot in the chest. Shun Sui Zanpakuto allows him to bring children's games into reality. Once he plays one game after another with Lil he ends up eventually activating his holy form, which is called Divine Judgment. Lil's holy form is represented by his third eye opening. Lil's holy form drastically alters his appearance as he takes on the form of a large white religious robe with several holes punctured through the top and bottom of it. He also grows eight golden wings, and that appears to be an oversized golden halo above his head. In this form, Lil is able to effortlessly teleport everywhere as he follows Shunsui around while he is injured. In chapter 646, we see Lil fire multiple shots at Shun Sui. Now these are from his enhanced version of the X-Axis. Lil also proves that he can occupy a three-dimensional space without requiring a physical form. Now this makes him practically untouchable by physical attacks as he is able to effortlessly deflect Shun Sui's Kido. Lil then further evolves into a second form as this grotesque ethereal appearance evokes images of how angels are depicted as bizarre otherworldly spiritual beings within the Bible. In this new form, Lil looks similar to a human with characteristics of an owl. His neck becomes elongated and his wings now resemble those of a bat's instead of an angel's. Additionally, his eyelids open and close horizontally now instead of vertically. Also, his shoes extend horizontally in length, making the lower half of his body resemble that of a centaur's. In this form, Lil is only wounded after Nanao uses her Shinken Hakyoken in order to deflect his ability Trumpet of God back at him. 
this destroys the halo above his head which costs him his godly powers. Following this, Lil's shards reform into dramatically weakened versions of his previous form as Lil's clones take the form of flamingo-like birds with short wings and elongated necks and legs. Lil Barrow is an incredibly fascinating member of the Shoot Starfall and he rightfully earns his title as the leader of the group and in my opinion, his ability the X-axis is one of the most formidable powers within the entirety of Bleach. If you want to learn more about it, then definitely check out my video that I've made on the X-axis, which breaks down every aspect of this unique shrift ability. Gerard Valkyrie is designated as Sternwritter M for the Miracle. Within the Can't Fear Unworld light novels, we learn an important detail about Gerard. It is revealed that his body hosts the heart of the Soul King. His shrift ability, the Miracle, allows him to manifest the impossible, as he is able to turn desperation into strength. The Miracle not only amplifies his size and power, but it also responds to damage that he takes. Gerard's appearance, combat style, and personality are heavily influenced by Norse mythology, as there are parallels with him and the Valkyries, which helps to explain his majestic and divine appearance. Gerard is well known for the battles that he takes part in against the Gote 13 during the end of the Thousand Year Blood War arc. It is here where he showcases his ability as he grows larger in size and more powerful as a result from any damage that he incurs during battle. Gerard is driven by his incredible loyalty to Yuhabak, and his holy form called Authority of God allows him to fire blasts of energy from the tip of his spiritual weapon Hofnung. Now these blasts are powerful enough to level down entire city blocks. It's for this reason that Gerard's special abilities are referred to as being hope infusing. In chapter 668, Gerard uses the miracle in order to manifest the hopes of his allies into Hofnung. When his powers are activated, Hofnung becomes unbreakable and it reflects back any damage that it takes back onto his opponent. When Gerard's body is destroyed by Byakuya's ability Ika Senjinka, the Quincy recreates himself, but he appears to take up a second new form. As his face takes on the form of a knight's helmet with two spikes on his shoulders, he also appears to no longer have any clothing and he appears to have golden energy patterns along his waist and his shoulders. Hitsugaya calls Gerard a monster when he sees this second form. Now despite Gerard eventually being defeated, his presence within the story leaves an unforgettable mark. A lot of fans have questions about the nature of his power and this whole concept of miracles and how it works within Bleach. Gerard's character embodies the themes of war, honor, as well as the ideas of hope and despair via his miracle powers, as he is able to turn despair-filled situations into something hopeful for himself. Gerard is one of the key members of the Shoot Starfall and he's a major figure during the Thousand Year Blood War arc. And honestly, I'm really looking forward to seeing how his role will be expanded within the anime in Core 3 and 4. I do have a standalone video on the channel where I speak about Gerard Shrift Ability the Miracle in great detail, so I highly recommend that all of you go and check that video out. Sternritter, see the compulsory Pernida, truly stands out amongst all of the Shoot Starfall members. This Quincy is no ordinary individual, as Pernida is in fact the left arm of the Soul King, and he embodies the concept of progress. This is in contrast to Pernida's counterpart Mimi Hagi, who embodies stillness. Unlike the other members of the Sternritter, Pernida's terrifying ability, the Compulsory, was not granted to him by Yuhabak, but was in fact an inherent power that he had received from being the left arm of the Soul King. With the Compulsory, Pernida is able to extend its nerves and infiltrate and override the nervous system of his opponents, allowing him to twist and contort his opponent's bodies to his will. It is truly a gruesome display of power, which essentially lets him grind people down into paste by twisting their bodies repeatedly until they die. Pernida's battle against Mayuri showcases the depth of his shrift ability to compulsory. Beyond just manipulating living tissue, Pernida can extend the influence of his power to inanimate objects, going as far as to reshape the entire battlefield with the extensions that reach out from his body. The compulsory proves to be a very resilient ability as it allows Pernida to control his severed limbs, allowing them to grow into clones of himself. During Core 2 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime, we learn that over a thousand years ago, Ichibei had personally visited the human world in order to speak with Yuhobak in order to form a truce between his Quincy Empire of Light and the Shinigami. Ichibei had brought with him the left hand of the Soul King, which was infused into his body as a precautionary measure for their meeting in case things started to fall apart. Now predictably, as the conversation started to get heated, 
defeated following Yuhobak refusing Ichibe's proposal, it leads to him then activating his ability the Almighty. But Ichibe then summons the left hand of the Soul King as he attempts to kill Yuhobak. But with his power the Almighty, he is able to hold down the left arm of the Soul King by using his Quincy defensive ability Blute. The left hand of the Soul King responds by possessing Yuhobak and binding his ability to use the Almighty. Ichibe then informs Yuha that his power the Almighty will remain unavailable to him until he dies. Now sometime following this altercation, we don't know how this happens, but the left hand of the Soul King would gain its own sentience and it would end up becoming a Quincy Sternritter within Yuhobak's army. And it would go by the name Pernida. At some point following this, Pernida would join into the ranks of Yuhobak's personal guard, the Shoot Starfall. When Pernida engages in battle, its physical form evolves as it reveals itself to be a monstrous creature which looks very different from its initial cloaked form. Pernida's true form is a giant left hand with chains between the fingers and an eye in the center of the palm. Pernida's holy form, which is revealed within an anime exclusive scene, grants him two wings which give him the ability to fly and he is able to use his wings in order to grab and attack his opponents. Despite the incredible strength of Pernida's powers, they do in fact have some weaknesses which Myri is able to exploit. These weaknesses stem from Pernida's nerve-based manipulation. The compulsory can be countered by in turn exposing the nerves of Pernida which will cause it intense pain. In chapter 643, we learn that Pernida's nerves can also be forced out of her body by a concentrated amount of Reatsu. Pernida's ability to adapt and constantly evolve based upon the bodies that he infiltrates with his nerves results in him being a very formidable opponent, as he truly embodies this theme of progress within the abilities that he possesses. In summary, Pernida is a fascinating Quincy with a unique origin story. There is definitely a lot more about his character that we don't know about, which is going to be revealed via more anime exclusive scenes in Core 3 and 4, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about this member of the Shoot Starfall in particular. Now the final member of Yuhobak's elite guard is Askin Naklova, who was given the letter D as his shrift ability, standing for the death dealing. Askin has a pretty distinctive appearance, but he is humorously compared to Aizen, as there was a lot of confusion when the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime had released its first few trailers, and fans were confusing Askin for Aizen. This is why Askin is labelled by fans as a budget Aizen. Via Askin's character, we learn about several different other Quincy, like how Askin explains that Lil Barrow is the leader of the Shoot Starfall, and how he reveals to us the true origins of Pernida and Gerard within chapter 656. He also is the one who informs Urahara about the five special war powers in chapter 662, and he also makes some comments regarding Grammy's powers in chapter 575. Askin's journey from being a standard Sternritter to then being promoted as a member of the Shoot Starfall is mostly credited to his survivability. This is a trait that had caught the attention of Yuha Bak. His ability to death dealing allows him to manipulate the lethal dose of any substance within his body. This is a power that he can extend to affect his opponents in devastating ways. Now his shrift ability is not just about inflicting death onto others, but it's about being on the brink of death. And it's similar to how Askin loves to dance on the razor edge between life and death, and he manipulates this fine balance to his advantage. His proficiency within battle is first demonstrated against Oetsu Nimaya, where Askin's tactical skills and the versatility of his moveset are on full display. By manipulating the lethal dose of blood within Nimaya's body, Askin proves that he can virtually transform an opponent's strength into their weakness. During this battle, we also learn about the resilience of Askin because even after he is fatally striked by Nimaya, he still survives and demonstrates how he can adapt for any battle scenario thanks to the unique qualities of his shrift, the death dealing. Later in the story, when Askin battles against Urahara and Yoriichi, he shows us the extended range of his abilities via his poison bath and gift ball techniques. Gift ball involves Askin throwing a small sized slow moving ball of poison towards his opponents. This ability is strong enough to make individuals like Grimjow collapse upon making contact with them. Poison bath involves Askin creating a large circle on the ground as he has control over anyone who steps within the radius of this circle. He can effectively lower their resistance to any substance such as reishi as he can literally make them be poisoned by high amounts of whatever substance he chooses. Askin's holy form called God's Taster amplifies his already incredible abilities, granting him not just enhanced offensive capabilities, but he can also create a poison realm which he can trap his opponents 
opponents within and even use a power called Gift Ring, which he can wrap around his opponents as it allows him to concentrate the powers of his shrift the death dealing into one focal point on his opponent's body, causing an instant death of that area of the body. Askin demonstrates this in chapter 664 of the manga. As an individual, Askin doesn't have blind loyalty for Yuhabak, but instead he is genuinely curious about the world that Yuhabak wants to create. This of course is a world which is devoid of the concept of death. This adds a layer of depth to Askin's character which is missing from the other members of the Stenrata, who for the most part blindly follow Yuhabak. Despite his very formidable abilities, the death dealing does have its unique share of weaknesses. Like if Askin's opponent is able to remove an element from their body that Askin is manipulating the lethal dose of, then his opponent can effectively lower the concentration of that substance so that it returns back to being below the lethal dose. The death dealing allows Askin to build up immunity to specific elements like an opponent's reishi, thus making him immune to their attacks. But if that reishi is even altered slightly, then it means that Askin can be affected by it again. However, this weakness no longer applies once he has activated his holy form. Now the major weakness of the death dealing is a drug that was developed by Urahara in chapter 662, which he describes as the death dealing vaccine. When injected into an individual's skin, it will allow them to recover from the effects of Askin's ability. Urahara notes how this is still a fairly new drug and the effects of this vaccine only last for about 5 minutes. In addition to these weaknesses, Askin's laid back nature and his tendency to explain what is going on leads to his opponents underestimating him. But Askin is aware of the fact that he is an underdog and he takes advantage of this in battle scenarios. Askin is a unique and fascinating character and one that is a very worthy addition to the shoot starfall. I'm a big fan of his personality as well as the unique nature of his shrift ability and I'm really looking forward to seeing how Askin's role will be expanded within the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. In particular, I really want to see an extended cut of Askin versus Urahara because I think there was so much left on the table with that fight when it comes to the manga and the anime has a massive opportunity to extend this battle. So this was my summary of the entirety of the shoot starfall, explaining what the group is as well as giving a brief profile of each of its members. As core 3 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime approaches, we are learning more and more about Yuhabak and his invisible Quincy empire and hopefully this video has helped you to better understand the shoot starfall and why they are an integral group within Yuhobak's army and they are going to be playing a massive role for the second half of the Thousand Year Blood War arc and I have no doubt that there are going to be a lot of anime exclusive scenes involving them when the anime returns. We've already seen anime original sequences when the shoot starfall had gone up against the Zero Division at the end of Core 2 so you can guarantee that the shoot starfall's battles against the Gotei 13 are going to be even more intense and filled with original sequences. So we've now reached the point of the video where I want to hand over the discussion to all of you. What do you think about Yuhobak's elite guard, the Shoot Starfall? Did you learn anything new about their backstory, personality, and their abilities from this video? And are you looking forward to more anime original scenes involving them in Core 3 and 4? Definitely be sure to continue the discussion in the comments. I look forward to reading all of your thoughts. And lastly, thank you for making it to the end of this video, and I cannot wait to see you in my next Bleach Explained video. A massive thank you goes out to all of my amazing Patreon supporters for helping to make this video possible. If you also want to support the channel and see your name in the end of my videos, then check out my Patreon which has loads of perks like early video access and so much more. Thank you for sticking around till the end of the video and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.